In the third volume of Pokemon Adventures, our heroes go and attack Team Rocket head-on. Will they succeed in stopping the evil team's ambitions of taking over the world? Well, yeah, there is 29 more volumes after this, and it's still being written, and it's a fairly idealistic series. And no matter how much the fan base uh, says it isn't, it is still written for kids. Then we have a confrontation between Red and Giovanni, where if Red loses, he becomes Giovanni's right-hand man. Finally, we have the conclusion to this chapter at the Indigo Plateau, with tons of foreshadowing of the next four volumes. Let's start the volume. It opens up with the standard page of introducing all the main characters, and... HOW DO YOU SCREW THIS UP?! Somehow, they managed to screw up before starting the actual manga. The stock art that they used for Red on this page is the exact same as the previous volume, so that means that Bulbasaur, which evolved at the very start of the previous volume, is still a Bulbasaur. The next problem, they mislabeled Charizard as Charmeleon. Maybe I'm making a mountain out of a molehill, but I've waited how many years for this to be reprinted? There are people out there who would like a job, and shit like this gets past the quality check. Maybe if it was some Pokémon that no one cared about, I wouldn't be complaining. But this was a Pokémon that was on the friggin' box, and had several Smash Brothers appearances, including one as a playable character, and was a big Pokémon in the anime. How can you do that? Tangent time! Speaking of people who don't deserve their job anymore, video game analysts, which might as well just be called professional attention whores. Here are a few quotes, their names have been omitted to protect their identities. And here's a free analysis from me, Namco Bandai. Do you want to make some money? Release your fucking games over here! Also, don't screw over your existing customers. The volume begins with our heroes learning the importance of teamwork by destroying a barrier and entering Saffron City, the location of the best Smash Brothers stage ever. Red and Blue are then separated. Red has to fight Lieutenant Surge, while Blue has to fight Koga. And I just have to say that Lieutenant Surge looks awesome. The design just kicks ass. Except Tomato didn't draw in the fingerless gloves here. Red is able to beat Lieutenant Surge in an electric cage, and for his victory he takes the fingerless insulated gloves. And I'll just quickly point out the fact that the amount of electricity that went through both of them should have killed them. Red quickly catches up and sees that Koga has defeated Blue. Red and Blue work together and are able to best Koga and Articuno by heroically committing arson. Meanwhile, Green has sneaked in and is trapped in an illusion from her past, while being attacked by Sabrina. Thankfully, she has a plan to get out of it. It involves tricking Sabrina into attacking her. There is an edit in the reprint. In the reprint, Green attacks Sabrina's sense of fashion. Apparently, this is enough to piss off Sabrina and attack Green. Although this edit does make me wonder how they are going to edit Sapphire's leaf bikini. If we actually get there this time, knock on wood. Green then pulls two Pokeballs out of her ass, resulting in a surprise attack which causes the illusion to break. Realizing that once the illusion comes back, she won't get this chance again, she flees. Back with Red, he finds a plot device. <laughs> And placing the seven badges in the plot device causes the three legendary birds to fuse together. Green proceeds to freak the fuck out and quickly faints. Our heroes try to fight the fusion, which results in Red using the Moonstone on Green's Clefairy. Our heroes are then knocked out of the building. Ivysaur quickly does his best Spider-Man impression and creates a web of vines to catch them. He then evolves into Venusaur and Green regains consciousness and brings out Blastoise. Charizard, Venusaur, and Blastoise then combine their power. This results in the Super Ultra Mega Awesome Pokémon going down in one hit! WHAT?! <laughs> to be fair, Clefable does weaken it, but I doubt to that point. And that was the first six adventures in this book. And now we have the introduction of the best Pokémon in the series. Red hears from Bill about a monster that is destroying the area near Cerulean City. He goes there to fight it and try to capture it. Also there is Blaine, who is having nightmares and is also searching for it. Mewtwo has two attacks, a giant tornado and a giant spoon. You might not think that this is very threatening, and it should have been something else like a giant spork, but this spoon can cut through a building, and he can probably kill Sephiroth with it. Anyways, Blaine is there to try and kill Mewtwo. Turns out that they are basically brothers. During the creation of Mewtwo in the last volume, the Mew cell wasn't enough to recreate a Pokémon. So he used some of his own cells, however, because he didn't sterilize the needle, some of Mewtwo's cells made it into his body, and now he is basically living with Mewtwo cancer. Fearing that his own creation may destroy the world, he is willing to kill himself in Mewtwo. And one attack later, Blaine thinks he has succeeded in killing the most badass Pokémon ever. 
Blaine explains that the real monster that was created wasn't Mewtwo, but rather the rocket scientist who experimented on Pokemon without remorse. However, it turns out that Mewtwo isn't a pile of ash right now and is rather pissed off about being attacked, and he is going to make sure that there will be no more heroes to try and stop him. So instead of having an epic desperate struggle, they just capture him with a Master Ball that Blaine ha just happened to have. While I won't blame them for using a Master Ball, since that was what everyone else did with Mewtwo, I will blame them for not duplicating it with Missing No first. <laughs> So, before the Indigo Plateau, we have one last plot thread, a confrontation between Red and Giovanni. Before he does, he rescues a little girl from the Viridian Forest and captures a Rattata for her. And... This is the only time that Pikachu is actually called Pika in the first three volumes, making it incredibly obvious who the next main character is. <laughs> There is an epic battle between Red and Giovanni. This is to determine if Red will continue living a hero or become Giovanni's right-hand man. While the battle is good, I feel that the ending can be summarized as Deus Ex Pikachu. Remember those insulated gloves that are fingerless? They apparently work, despite electricity taking the path of least resistance to the ground, meaning his fingers and then Red's body. The second, electricity doesn't work on ground-type Pokémon. After his victory, Red collapses due to exhaustion, most likely brought on by breaking the very laws of reality. Now we are at the final adventures of this book and chapter. The Indigo Plateau begins, and we learn Green's backstory through Professor Squarehead, who has secretly entered the tournament. And he has a bondage kink. Green was abducted by a bird Pokémon when she was a child, giving her a fear of birds. And this becomes important in the third chapter, where the big bad is the masked man. The other masked man. There is a printing mistake that took them three releases to actually fix, which I would actually applaud if it wasn't for the shit at the start of the book. And there is the final battle between Red and Blue. Up in the shadows, there are four mysterious people watching the battle. Red wins and becomes the champion. While the battle is rushed, I feel that it does show how much Red and Blue have matured throughout the first three volumes. And that's the first chapter of Pokemon Adventures. Next chapter sees our heroes facing off against the evil group known only as PETA. Now for something different, Best of Pokemon Adventures Red. I previously mentioned this in my first review as a messy clusterfuck. While I believe that this got the better treatment than the yellow version, they still cut out a lot of stuff, and it still seems relatively pointless. This seemed to be released in order to test the waters if people were still willing to buy Pokemon licensed manga, or to see if Pokemon was still a fad. While this is a perfectly viable strategy, I think it's a load of crap. This is the only manga that has a section on Serebii's site. It certainly isn't obscure compared to the other Pokémon manga, and there certainly was next to no risk for re-releasing it. I guess the main point that I'm going to make here is that there was a demand for it. People were willing to import the manga from Singapore. As for the book itself, this is an abridged version. Cutting the first three volumes down into one and generally isn't composed of what I'd consider to be the best of the first chapter. What was previously just a rushed plot was made worse. So this is basically a worthless piece of shit and not worth your money, especially since the three volumes are readily available and at an affordable price. And considering that the cost for this is the same as the first volume, the only reason to buy it now is if you're a collector of Pokemon merchandise. In fact, I'm pissed off that Viz released this instead of the first volume. Had they released the first volume back then and they kept the one volume every two months schedule, we would be at the 22nd volume right now and waiting for the 23rd volume to be released on the 1st of June. That being said, when they do get to the Ruby Sapphire chapter, that line better be kept as, Did you, did you really, really think, think that we would just, just quietly walk, walk away like, like nothing has happened? happened? All who stand against us shall die, and die, and die. Go to hell.